And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me I have my good brother, the, fe the fellow official ho hockey nut of, of the monastery, and the man who is... Cur who is currently who is currently laughing at the at the Leafs for losing to the most to the least successful franchise in the NHL? Good brother Maddie, how you doing today, man? I am doing okay. I am skipping the Thunderdome fiasco, and yes, I've already made the joke pre pre tape. I'm not doing it now, but yeah, I you know I'm laughing at the Leafs for <laughs> being the Leafs. I have my apologies to Steve Dangle. I've subscribed to his videos. He's a charismatic little fellow, but he has to be at least fan. And every time they lose, I must laugh at him. To be to be fair, I think I think um, I think he I think he's la I think he's I think he does enough laughing at the at at being a. He wrote a whole book about the about how the team drives him crazy. So I think he knows what he's that, doing. That and how it turned him into a a, a a local media celebrity. By the way, being paid. To yell in front of a camera, and be paid a little bit more to do a podcast about about the fact that he hates that that he that he hates hates slash loves the Leafs, and getting a book deal out of it, Monk. He's living the dream. Oh, I'm, we forgot about one other thing. Didn't he was involved in that um, Leafs therapy set of sketches on Sportsnet? Yeah, he's got he's got uh, the Leafs uh, therapy. He's got uh, hat picks and dang it, mm -hmm. um, you know, this guy's living the dream. Huh? You know, he, he laugh. I, I, you, we can laugh at him all he wants, but he's the one laughing at the bank. Yeah, he's got I a would, house payment. He's feeding his kid with that. I would say that there's um, there's two, there are two, there's two, indiv there's two individuals at Sportsnet who. Whose um work whose work I de I definitely enjoy and um I will admit I enjoy them for different reasons. Um, <laughs> one of them is is Dangle obviously, and the other one simply because I like the uh, back and forth that they that they have, and I and I like the um and it's a very old school kind of set that they have. Um, Tim and Sid. Oh yeah, like it's it's too bad they have to do it to, they, the whole whole social distance thing, but. Mm -hmm. uh, you watch a few of their shows, and they got a nice, they got a swanky set for a for a radio program. Well, what I like about their particular setup is it remind it very much reminds me of a lot of a lot of the talking of a lot of talking shows like the Best Damn Sports Show period or um, oh yeah or the or the uh, early days of Pardon the Interruption. The problem that oh, I yeah, have yeah, with yeah. a lot of with a lot of um, sets that you might see on say Fox or ESPN is that they are way too clean too overproduced like actually i think if nothing else pti looks looks as the sleekest slash them like they've kept a lot of their uh, of their trinkets from the from uh years and years of broadcasting and just collecting their shit and putting them on set so yes it looks clean but it looks like them and that's good everyone else it's either green screen or a nice clean glass desk that's just ready to break if you're not careful. Yeah, and that's just one sports blooper away from making every top ten for the rest of eternity on the blooper scale. And when it comes when it comes to when it comes to those clean sets, the only the only the only one I can really to I can really tolerate is um, undisputed because. Well, for one, Shannon Sharp is a national treasure, and I like roast. I like seeing Skip Bayless get roasted. Yeah. <laughs> like the there's there's a there's a short list of sports people that that you'd lo that you'd love to have at a um at like a barbecue and so or something like that. Skip Bayless, I would I would just give him a few drinks and just let and just let him ramble about whatever he feels like rambling. <laughs> <laughs> I'll only understand half of it, but I'll still have a good time. Just put a camera. Make sure he signs a, a, a thing. Says I, 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 the, the words that are coming out of my mouth are my own, and just put a lapel mic. Give him a couple of drinks, and hey, and hey ho, you got a, you got one season of TV right there. Mm -hmm. um, 
I remember that there was that pi there was that pilot that um that's where when it came to working some kids into shape that Scott Steiner would have had. And, on one oh, hand, God. it's unfortunate that that never came that that never amounted to anything. On the other hand, can you imagine if that actually got like twelve episodes and how how many times they'd have to get fined by the FCC? No, no, dude, fuck that. That would have been a Netflix thing, and that would have been a stellar. Scott Steiner, the wrestling internet would make Netflix viral in half a minute with anything with Scott Steiner yelling. Yeah. And this is him yelling Scott at kids Steiner for not for, not, like, for, for yeah. not hacking it athletic enough. So, <laughs> so dude, so. I'm pretty, you know, as much as I would hate it inside of like half an hour and have 15 minutes, half an hour of him yelling at me, calling me a fat ass. Come on, people would pay money for that. I'm sure they'd pay, pay money for that. I'm sure. Now, um, bit of good, bit of good news and a bit of bad news. Um, good news, the Lord of the um, finale for the Lord of the, for Lord of the Rings month is going to be coming next week. Um, and after that, I'm get and I'm ar I'm already starting to record some parts of it. But there's two there's two projects that I'm get, that I'm going to be working on in, in September. The first is the the um, RPG a day thing. I was going to do it in August, but by the time I got the document, it was already August fifth, and I would have had to do four videos up to that point, and then do each one, and then do each one each day after that. And I was already in the middle of doing the stuff for Lord of the Rings month, so I just said, you know what? There's thirty days in September. I'll just kick it down to then. Besides, I'm not. Besides, Gen Con's gonna be online anyway, so who gives a shit? Um. The other, the other thing, I am. I um. When there was that whole thing with Lily Wachowski claiming that the Matrix is an allegory for being trans, I was gonna rip that a new asshole, but I decided I'm gonna take a different approach. I am. I'm going to. I'm going to use. I'm going to use that t that space to extrapolate on a little on a little something that I have called Rowling's disease. Mm. Basically, when you basically when you try and add thing when you try and add things post hoc to a work that you've created, the problem is nobody's going to care because you didn't put it in the work. Um. That and go. That and well, I um, whenever a creator says that the, that a work is about a specific thing, I don't like that, because you're eliminating the discussion that's at the hallmark of nerd culture. Like you're killing off the myth, you're killing off the mystery. You are to to put it to put it in a way, killing the business. Ha. <laughs> The only reason I bring that kind of thing up is because I um, earlier today I was watching Dave Knows Wrestling's video on Enochiism, and the oh fan, yeah, the first the first comment that I saw made a very interesting point. Enochiism was like a inverse WCW in two thousand. WCW was killed yeah. by ridiculously silly booking. New Japan was almost killed by ridiculously serious booking. Yeah, and Noki had a hard on for uh, for for MMA. While he wasn't wrong that MMA would took eventually took over the pay per view business and has a, has an influence in professional wrestling, he took it too far. Now, now, period. Mm -hmm. And you want to know who's you want to know who's one, and because of that, um, that was the reason why I think. Um, Noah was able to get such a giant foothold in the 2000s. They kept it simple. Wrestling is wrestling. Well, not not only that, but a bunch of the big stars moved moved over to all Japan, and then and then uh, when Baba pa when um, Baba passed away, they moved over to Noah. Pretty much. Um, anyway, um, so I, I sense. I sense your your your. I sense the the this yeah. So I I sense you want me to talk about wrestling. Uh, <laughs> what my thoughts on wrestling is. I, I 
One, I'm not watching uh, Dynamite right now. I'm actually going to try to catch that tomorrow when uh, when I have to actually have time because I felt not, like not watching stuff again. It's the over it's the overexposure of the Thunderdome thing, which by, by the way I did see uh, SmackDown or a couple of gifts from the SmackDown thing. It's nice that they're back in an arena and everything else, but no, just no. All I see are plants. Plant. Well, yeah, you could sign up. You know what it is? You could sign up for the thing. There's like a link. You sign up, and if you sign up, you're you're in a Zoom call with like sixteen thousand people. You who can rotate, and you're gonna get instructions. And yeah, they're plants. They're they're fucking plants. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but no. Like someone, I think. Uh, Jay Coggins on uh, Twitter said, "Hey, they're bringing. Is that count? Is that count as bringing back crowds? I want the WrestleCast back." And I'm like, <sighs> I feel like I'm being forced. You know, I like, think I honestly I think um, Dynamite is doing this a bit more smartly. Yeah, what was because the, there, was there the there's people taking a shit on there. There's obviously people taking a shit on them selling tickets. And okay, but no, they, it, they're a within their right, and they're kind of taking what New Japan's doing: limited capacity, split up, social distancing, and there's no circulated air. They're in an out, they're in an outdoor venue. Mm -hmm. Oh, and if if uh, and they're double serious because anyone that that tries to sell their ticket to a to a secondary market, they're going to cancel the order. It's all right; those those are back on sale. Because they don't want people, they want people coming in and doing their thing, and and not spread the fucking thing. And I guarantee, I guarantee you, they're gonna, I guarantee you, um, they're gonna sell out. If if not already, I, I'm pretty sure they have sold out of those tickets. And you know what? At this point, until like when I made that thing back in March, when I said we're we're taking a break, and then we'll, we're going to come back when fans are allowed back. I said full out, sold out, actual, actual people, you know, mm -hmm. and sold out loud. No plants from a Zoom call where they where they're not allowed to scream because they're in a, they're in an apartment or they have roommates or whatever. No, no, live live crowds. I, I want live crowds. And New Japan has close, but they're not a full crowd. AEW will have wrestlers ringside and. Marks in the stands, but that's not a full crowd. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the same. That's one. Two, I've been enjoying my time off not giving a fuck about WWE. And yeah, I've talked about it with Shades and everything else about, uh, oh, let's, let's, um, yeah, I want to bring back the show. And I said, no, you, you don't have to talk about WWE. But here's the thing even if I don't talk about WWE, there's some connotations of, w of WWE in it. And I don't feel like watching shit from a Thunderdome with Vince in the in the background going, God damn it, god damn it, cheer, god damn it, cheer. Look, the sole reason oh, no. the sole reason I did I didn't jump on it is one, um after 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 the Roman Reigns incident, I can't I canceled my subscription because I wasn't having fun and I haven't looked back since. I'll watch a couple of YouTube mm -hmm. clips here and there, but I jumped over to New Japan World, and I I think I'm doing good. I think I'm doing good there, because um, if I'm not having fun, your, invest, having fun, your investment and, and patience has paid off. I mean, so far, so good. Yeah. Um. And anyway, and let, but with with all the, with all the bullshitting out of the way, let's get started with the Kickstarter spotlight. So the first one that we have is Quell. This describes it as self as real gaming, real exercise, zero compromise. You are fighting through a fantasy world using using workout using a kind of workout equipment setup. Um, I think we had something like this with Ring Fit with the Switch, although this is looking a lot more in depth than that does. So Quell is designed to do a high-intensity resistance-based combat workout at home. Travel through a fantasy world fighting enemies with your bare hands and get fit at the same time. Which I'm per I'm perfectly fine with that idea because the reason why I've never been a big I uh, never jumped on a lot a lot of um, video game exercise get 
gimmicks like the um like the ring fit on the on the switch or the or we fit or the Wii boards is um they don't provide resistance like the ring fit provides some resistance but not enough I get it and, and you know what it looks like it's a game that 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 can be used like it's funny uh two things like there were two showcases that uh, games done quick and I know of of the position of this uh, particular show has but one game was literally they played like a DDR clone as a showcase mm -hmm. and there's skill and exercise in that yeah there was a yeah. VR game by like uh, Half-Life uh, Alex was showcased mm -hmm. and yeah, there's a lot of movement and all that stuff, but it's it's one of those. I could see stuff in this. It's obviously this is already minutes goal. I could see stuff in this like this be produced, and then a couple years later, it's like thrown in like in the awful block just because it's it it looks so cheesy. At least at least with this, um, I'm looking at this vest thing, and we do we do have some degree of resistance ba resistance bands on the on the upper end of things. Mm -hmm. you can see it you can see it it's attached to the uh, vet it's attached from the uh, wrist to the vet to the vest so it's gonna it's gonna pull when you ex when you try and extend your arms for a punch so if an, if anything it if anything it it be it um would be a nice little return to form for pe for um people who missed who uh, missed playing um, we punch out. <laughs> hey, we punch out's fun mm -hmm. for whatever. Yeah, for whatever you like to think. Yeah, there it's fun. Yeah. Um, although they emphasize this is a game, not a boxing. They're not trying to do a boxing simulator. Um, sure, um, sure. It's but you are you are going to be doing a bunch of a bunch of hand to hand taking on opponents and get and getting stronger. Although I can't help but laugh at the fact that you have effectively bionic arms. Um. Like. I like the I I like the idea, but these but these sort of things, um, are always are always a bit tricky. What's real? What's when it comes when it comes to the resist when it comes to the resistance bands? I I can definitely see the um set. I can definitely see the setup and its potential. Um, what a more what's really get what's really going to make or break this is going to be the responsiveness. At the very least, I'll give them props for the fact that they seem to have a working prototype. But you, you and I have um, seen seen how how much um, responsiveness when it comes to any sort of motion control matters. Yeah, the, this is something that even the Switch still has tr trouble, uh, occasional troubles with. This is something that they and Nintendo has been tinkering with that since the Wii. Mm -hmm. That's over a decade ago. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars and a prototype, sure. But you're not, you're not, you're not figuring this out overnight. You're not. Yeah. So apparent, apparently, apparently, it's going to be Bluetooth based. So you can, so you can connect. Okay. It to PC, okay. Mac, or phone. Okay. That's all. That's all. Is one issue because I was worried that they were going to have some sort of proprietary, de proprietary device aside aside from the harness. Looks like that's not the case. Um, um, yeah, this is going to be Bluetooth pairing, which that makes sense. I mean, most even the the Switch Joy-Con have like have some sort of Bluetooth technology in there, so if that makes sense. Although, um, now it could be argued that I'm a little harsh on uh, motion controls, and I will I will admit that they will be my whipping boy until I'm forced to stop at gunpoint. But I don't do it solely out of malice. There is the fact that. Motion control motion controls have a very high failure rate, and I know some people will say, "Well, what what about Mario Galaxy? What a, what about Wii Sports and all that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, how many how many good how many good motion control games can you think of outside of first party shit?"
But hey, I'm I'm already I'm already doing a I'm already doing a fair amount of um a fair a fair amount of work now, so I'd be I'd be willing to try it a bit. Let's see let's see where they're at. So they're asking for twenty five thousand pounds. They're currently at one hundred and thirty eight point five thousand pounds with thirty five days to go. Five days to go. Which that's not too shabby. Um, let me see what they're asking. Um, not for. at all. Let's see what they're asking for when it comes to the baseline equipment. But. I am I am sorry I am the in order to get the baseline in order to get the baseline equivalent um I would have to I would have to pay 169 pounds or about 222 bucks. That is way, oh, too, much. No. way too much. That's too much. No. The most that I would pay for this setup, putting aside the Quell Plus thing that they want to that they want to add in is 150. Like I could, I could, I can get a, I can get a, res, I can get a top quality resistance band for about 109. And I'm, to, and I'm talking one that you're, that you're going to see pro athletes use. So if you're asking me to pay twice that for, the, for this setup, especially with something that is, that is only going to be working upper body and not lower body, I need, I need, you're going to need to do better than that. I'm hoping that that's not the price that they, if this thing goes to retail, that that's not the price they put it at, but we'll see. At the very least, they chose the, they chose the right time to do this because obviously nobody can go to the gym. And even if the gym wants to reopen, then you've got the shit like the whole thing that happened in New Jersey. Uh. Which, um. If they if they if they want to reopen with with their with well while having safety guidelines, don't try and sabotage their shit. Because I looked into that and that whole that whole thing felt like somebody was trying to was trying to was trying to do some some deliberate sabotage, because in their case it was either reopen or go out of business. But I digress. So next, if, as soon as the thing will load, there we go. Overarms, a rules light RPG heavily inspired by Persona and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. So they, a lot of over narration then. They're asking for thir they're asking for thirteen hundred. Oh, that's been mad. Oh, look at that. Yeah, they got they got ten times what they were asking for. And they've still and got then some. To go. And oh, then some. Cool. They were they were about to add another grand on top of that. Look at that. Mm -hmm. They'll probably add another grand by the time we're done. So they are this uh, and that's not too bad considering that this is apparently their first Kickstarter. And they are from Cincinnati, but we'll not hold that against them. Is Cincinnati is a nice Cincinnati is a nice place. It's just that the it's just that the Bengals suck. Yeah, but they're aiming to to replicate media like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Persona, Fate, Shaman King, and more. It says. Overarms is set in a world where select people are able to develop an anima, a powerful psychic manifestation of their own psyche and will. These anima are able to assist their user in a myriad of ways in and out of combat based on the strengths of their individually unique abilities. In Overarms, players can expect to weave stories of mystery and intrigue as they discover this new world around them and within. So apparently they released a black and white quick start book earlier in the year, which I didn't, which I wasn't aware of. That had a look at core mechanics, developing their own character slash anima, and playing a few games. And they have the quick start rule book. I'll probably take a look at that later. 
So let's see. They mentioned that it's going to be rules light, so I can't I can't see this thing going over 150 pages. Yeah, rules light, 150 pages. Yeah, that yeah, no. Mm -hmm. And it goes into the basics on on the matter. So it looks like there are only there are only four um so sorry five stats for Nanima. Power, speed, defense, range, and AP. Um, AP being short for Anima po Anima points, and it's basically the amount of times you can use your Anima before you start suffering fatigue. And it looks like they, so they've already got a bullet point list of what of what they have for the thing, including they're going from levels one through ten. Interesting. So yeah, they they're saying about a hundred plus a hundred plus pages in a um, six by nine format. Interesting. And apparently, the Persona Four art books are their visual inspiration for the book's layout. Let's see, then, then with the goal, the game is complete. The, the, apparently the Kickstarter here is just to fund getting some, getting some better art and getting some layout done. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Rooster Emma's involved with this. Huh, fancy that. Um, but yeah, I'm... I'm very tempted to send these guys a line and see if I can and see if I can get them on the show. Um, I know that Rooster Emma I know isn't gonna get isn't gonna get on because he's kind of busy. But the rest, but the others, well, worst they can do is tell me no. It's worth a shot. Mm -hmm. So next we have Soul, a sci-fi fantasy universe for Savage Worlds, specifically Savage Worlds Adventure Edition. Although, I think this one might not make the cut. Because they're asking for... Uh, for, uh, for first off, get the Oilers jokes ready because the uh, team involved is from Edmonton. <laughs> they are asking for 6.2 thousand Canadian. They are currently at 4.2 thousand. Uh, uh, which... In five days, uh, it's going to be tough to do. Is it doable? Yeah, it's just not absolutely easy. And they did put out a test drive version, and I, th I think I see why this might have a big bit of an issue. So he wants to he wants to do a a SF uni, ASF universe involving the control of a um, resource called Shade that um, is both a currency and is used for hyperspace get, travel and magic. So the spice from Dune, mm -hmm. and we have three factions in, in involved in the war for control of this kind of thing: the Astros Empire. Which, oh, which, well, it's an empire with an, it's a very old school Roman empire, including the abundance of slaves. Um, the, the Dynamis, which, ha, which has the money and star and star Mecca. Which is run by well a machine. The big three and avoid all out war with each other, but the minor factions in each section in each faction often clashes with each other. Um, magic is often used, which is interesting for an SF approach. Um, I 
apparently he had apparently he's setting up a uh, dice tower which is nice i always i always like the idea of dice towers i just never get a chance to use them for for um obvious reasons like mm -hmm. like i think i think the i think the problem let me see is this his first one no it isn't i th i think the i think the problem is is that the um the art that he's using for the cover I've seen that art before. A lot of people have. So with that and with and um with the fact that there's a lot of stuff out there in the third party for Savage Worlds, even more so than D&D in some cases. So I don't think I um I think that might be the reason why also um I think the Kickstarter was a little bit I think the way the page is set up for this is a little bit backloaded. Like all the all the real all the real detail about the setting was towards the back instead of up instead of up front immediate. Cuz that and it mentioned this is it mentioned I think a bit too much about the fact that it's based on Savage Worlds. Yeah, we get that. You have the Savage Worlds licensed product emblem right on the right on the top we can figure that part out so i think that's what um what definitely what definitely didn't help so next all the way from pracy studios let's see if this will load we have nocturne and we've talked about this a while back when its demo version came out and well this time we got somebody from Vancouver. So um my condolences for dealing with Benning. Yeah. And the and the and the Grizzlies. Are they the Timberwolves now? No. <laughs> no, they're still no the Grizzlies just moved to Memphis. Oh, the Memphis, yeah. Doi. But, oh, it looks like it updated. So, he's asking for 70,000 Canadian. He's currently at 6.5 thousand. This Kickstarter just opened up, like, three days ago. And they've got 25 days to go. They'll... I'd say they might have a little bit easier of a time given the fact that given the fact that we're dealing with video games and not with um a very a very specific um tabletop setup. Yeah. The prelude mm -hmm. has already been, has been out for a few months and was and has been seen very positively. Now, the idea is a story-driven RPG set in a digital afterlife. And when it come and when it comes to his combat system, they decided to go with a rhythm based approach. Which is very much reminding me of Step Mania or DDR, and I can't be the only one seeing that from this GIF. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, some of that stuff. Like I looked at the trailer, it it, it gave me a little bit of uh, rock band slash guitar hero vibe to it. From like the way that things seem to be control. It'd be funny as hell if we if I could control if I could hook up say a DDR controller and control the um, combat scenes through that. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so appar apparently humanity is extinct, but you've arrived in a digital afterlife. Your conscience was uploaded to a world where. A sentient AI has taken control, twisted creatures roam the land, and a corruption spreads. As you search for your brother, you become entangled in a power struggle between the admins. So, apparently the mo one of the main motifs is, what does it mean to be alive in a digital world where minds are just code running on a machine? You take the red pill... And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. <laughs> Not gonna lie, a lot of Matrix vibes to it. Um, 
that Amazon Prime show upload, I think is what's called, it comes to mind as well on, on the vibe there, but a lot more dystopian, obviously. Yeah. Um, so they, they're inspired by traditional RPGs. Translation, probably the uh, SNES era. And yeah, their combat is inspired by DDR style four column rhythm games. And apparently you won't need to micromanage cooldowns and mana in Nocturne, but you'll benefit from buffs and abilities you get through equipment. So during battle, you, f you just focus on the note playing. Okay, nice, nice. Um, the, only, the only problem that I could conceivably see happening with this is is the combat end of things and the equip and the equipment end of things feeling divorced from each other let's see so our main character is karma who's looking for not making that joke nope mm -hmm. nope 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 not making that joke well it's not spelled with an h so the joke wouldn't apply And let's see. We also ha we have Kim we have Kimothy. Interesting. Then we have then we have Satoru. And I don't know why, but does Satoru look like a fish version of Iroh to you? <laughs> let's see. And yeah, and Yako, who apparently is is. Is has a, a mind that's split between two bodies. One's a human, the other's a fox. Let's see. So appar apparently they've got a few other things that they've got planned. So uh, apparently the um, equipment part is the fa is deal determines what sort of benefits you get when you start getting high enough combos. Um, like an item with the barrier ability will activate after getting a high enough combo, creating a protective shield that reduces oncoming damage. An item with the restore ability will heal you, but but only if you land enough perfect notes. Um, this is where it's going to come down to how forgiving it is when it com when it comes to people who aren't who aren't um doing things like playing through the fire and flames on expert. Which I can't. No, not not very many can. Um, let's see. You might also encounter corrupted objects that have to be restored through a mechanic called silence, playing a sequence of notes while dealing with unusual mechanics such as the columns moving around or even going invisible. I'd say invisible is a dick move. Let's see, then customiza customization. Okay, nice, nice. Let's see what they let's see how high they go with um So the highest they go with the stretch goals, which I think I think that's implied to be a new game plus is hundred and seventy thousand Canadian. The other ones they've got, but it doesn't say. And apparently, the mu the mus the genres of music that they want to focus on are progressive symphonic rock, specifically from Joao Luis, and melodic ex electronica of Miro Miro. Not not all that familiar with either of them, but this is going to be obviously this is going to be the kind of game that lives and dies on its soundtrack. And. This is Precy's first Kickstarter, and he's made it clear this is a passion project, and I think it shows. I get the feeling this is going to meet its goal, but I'm not entirely sure if it's going to hit any stretch goals. I'll keep an eye on this one. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So next is Locus, from which managed to get funded in 39 hours. 
Although, since they were asking for a modest amount, let's... It's showing me the, it's showing me the U.S. amount. Let me see if I can get if I can get it converted. Come on, show up. I'll check on it later. But they managed to get funded to um, to the tune of almost ten grand, and they've still got twenty five days to go. But they are doing a mystery horror role playing game where you are exploring consequence and morality against supernatural danger. You have, you're unraveling the mystery of the world and then surviving it. Now the, now the Kickstarter is to fund the print version of this, of this game, as well as, do, as well as do some polishing. But uh, look, it'll be printed as two full color A5 hardback books. Although, t with the director's guide being about 150 pages and the player's guide about 60 pages, although they outright state this may be subject to change, I do like that they list where the funds will go. Let's see, and that then a bit of a um, a bit of a background. So. Their inspirations include Silent Hill, Event Horizon, Juon, Forbidden Siren, Limbo, Penumbra, Jacob's Ladder, Pan's Labyrinth, and Triangle. It's not a bad spread. But... Appar the only the only real problem that I'm having is that I is next is um fig is figuring out where this is where this is going to where this is going to mechanically differ from other horror games like obviously this isn't going to be like playing Call of Cthulhu but where is this going to differ from say Chill or Don't Rest Your Head. I mean, I get it's very clear that they're doing a very rules light game with the fact that apparently the character sheet is a playing card. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it looks like they'll be doing it. They, if they, with some of the stretch goals, they have a sci fi setting, a World War I setting. Interesting. An ancient his, ancient historical setting. Some more playing cards and guest stories. And then the pe then the people involved. And I'm not I'm I'm not quite willing to get on to get on board with this because um there's a reason that when we do when we did Monastery at the Table, I never really delved into a horror game. And I think the closest we got was the Genesis, and that was an experiment. And it mainly has to do with the fact that I'm not confident that I can do horror with the with the usual group because we're all a bunch of riffers. That's not a good or a bad thing. That's just me make. That's just me making an observation that I ha that I have to work with. Needs to be done. Now, Needs to be said. Now, could I work with something a bit more kitsch, like chill, in that regard? No, probably. I just need to find the right the right angle. I mean, chill is is meant is meant to be camp is meant to be camp. I mean, hell, the um. One of the, the the original version of Chill had a module that had Elvira on the cover. Which, as I mentioned in the past, I'm not too proud to say it. I'm not. I I am proud enough to. I'm not too proud to to admit that. I that I bought it for that I bought the I bought it for that particular cover. Nope. No bully, you know how you know how it is. Cause I like Elvira. 
<laughs> and especially uh, and um I will I will admit that when when a certain politician did did a whole did a whole speech did a whole speech about that was themed around I'm you she she um she parod she parodied it by say by saying by doing her own version saying I'm you except with bigger tits <laughs> <laughs> But next is Deadline from Vscape Studios. Let's see if we can get this thing to load. Oh, sorry, Dead Lane, which um, I may be tempted to to keep a close eye or even support this one for two reasons. One, they're from my state <laughs> because go, because because go team ten thousand lakes. They're from Rochester. I'm I'm, I'm I'm familiar Rochester, Minnesota, I should clarify, not Rochester, New York. Ah, okay, okay. I'll be right back. All right. But Dead Lane is a survival horror slash racing game <laughs> that is inspired by Dead by Daylight and Need for Speed. <laughs> okay. You've got you've got my attention already. Um, you are pitted against five other contestants in a race for survival, and you have to escape danger from with a high speed strategy. High speed strategy. You start out in an abandoned garage, and upon exiting, you and your rivals are subjected to the darkness that engulfs every road. As you center your attention to passing the completion. You might catch a few glimpses about what hides around you. They are doing their own version of the killer survivor dynamic that you'd see in Dead by Daylight. So there are only two roles that you can embody that are embodied: the chaser and the chased. Both have their own gameplay mechanics. And the cha the chase the chaser has better max speed, unlimited turbo, better handling, and guard immunity. Whereas the cha whereas the chase is middle of the road with all with all of them. But the chaser will ultimately be eliminated at the end of the lap, regardless of where they ranked. So the closer you the closer you are to laps end, the more at risk it is to play as the chaser. So at, the only way to avoid elimination is as the chaser is you must pass the curse on to another racer before the lap ends. Each racer is picked off one by one until only a few remain. It's in this crucial final lap that the chips are down and the game recalls itself back to its racing roots. Okay, interesting. Playing as the chase revolves around escaping. You have to find the short, smartest routes to take, preserving all available resources and protecting yourself against malicious spirits, as well as the chaser's ill intents. So we have a kind of off-road car, kind of off cart that you're going to be racing with. Along with upgrades that you can put in, and some alternate and some alternate routes, if they so choose. And playing as the each. You basically have to, playing as the chaser. You basically have to try and hit somebody with the grut with some sort with a yeah, grudge in order to in order to actually get some head some headway to actually survive more than one lap. Of course, if the chaser is eliminated after the end of that lap, whoever is in dead last, they become the next chaser.
But there's also the Wrath of a Spirit called Telly. So that so that's a threat to deal with. And we've got a set of tr a set of tracks. I'd imagine that there's not going to be as many tracks here as there might be in other racing games because they need to account for going off road. Let's see. Let's see, chase or re They have a chase or re chase mode, time trials, and out and an outrun mode. No laps, no timers, no positions. Just fleet after fleet of horrific and aggressive roadblocks standing in your way. It's an interesting approach. And they've got a D they've got a decent amount of people wor working on the th working on the thing. But still, racing and racing and survival and um, horror. I didn't those that's a combination I didn't think I'd see. Let's see. So they're asking for thirty thousand. They're currently at three point five thousand with thirty two days to go. I am hoping that they manage to get that. And our last one, a bit of a, a bit of a comic entry, is going is Commander Rao, a dystopian action one shot. Let's see, on the final dawn of an exhausted war, a rogue commander sets out on a war path to confront a tyrannical baron. So they're asking for sixteen hundred. So they're asking for sixteen hundred. Oh, sorry, twenty two hundred Canadian. They're at seven thousand and change with five days to go not too shabby and given the fact that it that it talks about a it talks about the story after the fact I get the I have to wonder if this is going to be like some Rashomon thing Although I do like Commander Rao's design. Maybe we'll see some fan art of that. Hmm. And yeah, a 28-page dystopian one-shot th told through action and minimal dialogue inspired by animated f fight scenes from Legend of Korra and Castlevania. Interesting. And it looks like they'll be putting in four extra pages because of the second stretch goal met. Let's see, then a bit on Commander Rao. Let's see what we have on... Definitely like the art style for this one. And looks like the letter is a squid. And we got a few we got a few updates. All right, sorry about that. Had to take Welcome a back. uh I had to go take a, uh, I had to take a, a Detroit Red Wings. <laughs> um, welcome back, welcome back. Um, we're ra we're wrapping up the com the um, entry for Commander Rao, which definitely looks interesting. Yeah, dystopian. Uh, this is a cross between. Uh, this is the one where that's a cross between Needs for Speed and another thing, right? Or this is another that was, one. That was before that. I was before that. Yeah, like that one. 
I want to see if I can get them on the show because the idea of mixing horror with racing is something I don't think I've seen since fuck it, Twisted Metal. Yeah, and it's even been a, a while. Story. The only the, the only, only Twisted Metal game I would explicitly consider a horror game is Black, i.e. And that's saying something because if you've seen some of the stories in Twisted Metal Black, you know that um, shit be fucked. Shit be fucked up. Mm -hmm. So next, um, Dark World Studios has put out an alpha slash beta of their 1930s esque RPG called called Archeron. It is so we have an arp. So the setting is that monsters and mystery merge together with magic, set in the 1930s, and when the government controls history. There's a war for resources fought by various factions, and in the horizon, the endless and foreboding shape of the wall. Oh, they're a Pink Floyd fan. So you can be another cog in the machine or head out into the streets, the places once lost to history, and try and forge your own destiny. Characters have an average of 6 hit points, and a 9mm does 1d10 damage. And given some of the artwork, this is definitely not going to be a fluffy kind of game. And when it comes to the... For a weird, for whatever reason, I'm reminded of the Genesis when I look at the art. I might have to, I might take a look at the uh, beta and see what I think on that. So next, Ember Wind has decided to launch a content suite called Nexus. Now, Ember uh, Wind is a, is a. Uh, is a setting independent GM optional game that uses a system called Rise that focuses on player agency. Nexus is design is a digital content suite to allow people to make it to allow to be made to allow it to be made easier to, for people to design their own content, ranging from custom foes, heroes, and everything else in between. It's also a hub for communities to build around. They plan to launch Nexus in phases with feedback collected after each one. The first beta run opened um, on August 17th and is going to run till the end of the month. And it's mostly going to focus on a bestiary and foe creator. Apparently the reason part of the reason that they ended up doing this whole Nexus thing is in is in part a response to the to the to the fact that this whole this whole beer bug has t has killed off a lot of conventions, which for for people like anime and comic book fans, yeah, that su that sucks. But I don't think people really take into account how much of a blow that's been when it comes to tabletop gaming. All right, I'll be right back. I gotta go take another one <laughs> <laughs> because. Role playing, ga role playing games. The main way that you get noticed is through conventions, and with all of these conventions going virtual, it's a lot harder for the independent end of conventions to get a f to get any real foothold. So. I'm not going to jump on the whole Nexus thing yet, but I might have to accelerate when I planned on reviewing Emberwind. Because I do have it. Now, next is the fact that apparently Masters of the Universe is getting a board game being developed by Archon Studios. Not bad. So I guess I guess Mattel really is serious about trying to trying to bring back um, Masters of the Universe. I thought the RPG thing I saw earlier this month was just going to be a one-off, but looks like they're going all in with a full-on Masters of the Universe board game. 
And let me see if I can find some images about what this board game will look like. And... nope. I mean, we've got some idea about what sort of characters we'll be dealing with, and they're going to... And they're gonna, and there's already some miniatures that th that you can get in advance, but that's all that I'm seeing right now. Although apparently one of, although what makes me laugh is that one of the characters that'll be available for this thing is She-Ra, and it's probably not going to be the one people are thinking. But hey, the cartoons crossed over, so why not? So next, <sighs> times like these, I wish I had brought back Geek of the Week. Because Marvel has been once again accused of, of pulling a copycat. Specifically, copying fan medals for Star Wars and a Star Wars Galaxy's Edge comic series. This was first discovered through a joint effort from um, Reddit and YouTuber Eckhart's Ladder. It was first seen in the fourth issue of the Galaxy's Edge tie-in series. But drawn by artist Will, S Will Sliney, it opens on a shot of a lone Imperial landing ship descending to Bot 2. But it looks a little bit too, clo too close to artist Rob Lee, Rob Lee Works' um, concept, concept of a line of Star Destroyers called the Vigilant Class. And looking at the video now, yeah, this is a little close to the line. Let's see, then the second image comes from the recently, from a Star Wars book illustrated by Jesus Size. And let's see, it looks like we have a... Escort frigate, and that image. It's cl it's certainly close. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure someone could ar someone could argue. Co someone's going to argue coincidence if this was ever brought to court. But we had a similar case of this from Marvel last year. Mostly because Luke Ross um, included the miniature's pegs in one of his drawings. Marvel has not commented, probably because they want to forget about it. But there was that instance in a, um, in, a, in a Marvel comic where somebody traced over a Tau hammerhead. So it's not the first time this kind of thing has happened. But next... There seems to be some trouble brewing when it comes to the development of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. And this, this dropped a few days ago. Their creative director, Martin Clooney, and their original game author, Brian Mitsoda, just dropped. They were, they were both fired from the project. Now Clooney had served as the cre now Mitsuda, who was who had written the original Bloodlines, had been serving as um, creative director. And on August, all right. Now, sorry about the extended Billy Mitchell break. Sorry about that. No, no worries. We're currently on the whole situation when it comes to Vampire: The Masquerade Two. Oh, okay. Yeah, because. As I, met, as I mentioned earlier before you had left, two of 
the the um create the the uh, creative director and and the um and the and the um and the uh, and the uh, author um had were both dropped so the core part of an update that they had posted was that lead narrative designer Brian Mitsoda and creative director Martin Kai Clooney are no longer part of the team at Hardsuit Labs as a result of a joint Ouch. decision made by the leadership of Hardship of Hardsuit Labs and Paradox Interactive. Apparently, in their stead, Alexandre Madri Madrikia sorry, will be becoming aboard as creative consultant who had previously been creative consultant for Assassin's Creed, Rainbow Six Vegas, and Space Marine. And, yeah, this wasn't a case of allowed to resign. They were fired. They didn't walk Straight away. Straight up fired. Here's, here's your pink slip. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Mitsuda would comment in a statement provided to Rock Paper Shotgun saying, quote, after almost five years' involvement with the studio, I was suddenly terminated on July sixteenth, two thousand twenty. That this came to me that this came as a shock to me is underselling it. He would proceed to describe how the pride in the work, the fan expectations, and the support from coworkers who started out as fans kept me going through this long five years. But also, ex but also said, "I'm I'm incredibly disappointed and frustrated to say that this is where it ends for me on the project." He then would go on to say, I was not part of the conversations that led to the decision to delay production, and to my knowledge, there were no delays caused by the Bloodlines 2 narrative development, that he was confident and proud of the work that he and his team had put forward. Ultimately, Mitsuda noted that when that work will be seen and what form will take is unknown to me. Now, it was... It was um, delayed because originally it was supposed to launch... Um, this fall, but it's been pushed to 2021. Now, whether or not this is another COVID related delay was never stated. Um, because they made that, they made that announcement back in, um, back in, back in August. And there's been <sighs> the development of Bloodlines 2 has been having problems. First off, there was the fact that um, on the Steam page they were censoring and banning people who who uh, criticized them for things like a pronoun selector as well as the main story being grounded in current day Seattle politics. Um And it, and people and people were worried that they were, that they were going to in, insert insert um, current year shit into the game. And the, and I think what re, I think what really got a lot of fans concerned is them state them stating that Bloodlines Two is a is a political game. Or or. As well as the thing, as well as saying, you, I don't believe you can look at both sides of a political argument without understanding both sides. It's easy to say this is good and this is bad, but it's definitely taking some political stances on what we think are right and wrong. Those two statements don't go together. If you're go, if you're going, whenever you're going to have a a moral a a gray argument where both sides have a point. You can't have the conclusion that one side is right. It's not how this works. Go back to writing go back to writing class and do it again. And then he gave his full statement. I um <sighs> I had high hopes for Bloodlines 2 initially. Now I can't say that I do. Like there's there's just w there's just way too many things that aren't red flags per se, but they're making me raise my eyebrows.
I mean, I'll uh, ultimately I mean, I'll judge when the game comes out, but I get the feeling there's a lot more trouble behind the scenes than we know. Matt, are you still taking a Billy Mitchell? No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm just you're 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 saying words that I'd be squawking at this point. <laughs> yeah, but I th I think it's I look you you know what you know when there you know a shit you know a behind the scenes shit show when you see one. Yeah, <laughs> most wrestling fans have been seeing it for years now, mm -hmm. but yeah. So I think I think you can understand my hesitation on this. More than most, I'm sure. So, what I'm probably going to, what's probably going to happen with this is Bloodlines Two will pro will probably not be a day one purchase for me. I will probably wait uh, six months, and then see what happens there. I'm also the other thing that concerns me is whether or not Paradox is going to try and paradox it. Because Paradox loves adding DLC to games. And fucking it up? No, they no, they do a decent job and, and um the worst that I the worst thing I can say about Paradox is putting too much DLC. Like if you want if you want to slowly if you want to see your wallet slowly die, look at all the DLC for say Crusader Kings 2. Do ya. Or God help you, Europa Universalis. And while I like while I like those games, um, you're not going to see me play them all that often because of the fact that if you're dealing with a game that's supposed to be set around the Crusades, you'd think that you'd be doing a lot of fighting. Here's the problem: the combat has never been one of Paradox's strong suits. In fact, this rat. In fact, it is a rather weak suit of theirs, because all that it all that it amounts to is a dice roll. Like they've they've got a very good they've got a very good political system in their games when it comes to the intrigue and backstabbing and um, random events that can happen, include. Including, including having your, including having your horse be a senator. Yes, that is. Dude. Yeah. Or 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 having or having the king of a country decide to seduce the pope and be successful. Yeah, Crusader Kings Two can be. Uh, it's a testament to the glories of RNG. In all the worst ways. But next, I I wanted to take some time to point out the manhole the manhole covers that have gone full weeb in in parts of in parts of um Tokorozawa. Including the one that got a, that got that got the snowflakes salty with the fact that the with the fact that the main character for for Uzaki chan wants to hang out is on one of them now the reason the reason why this is being done is to celebrate the opening of Tokorozawa Sakura town um, at the start of August a pop culture center that's that's opening up in Saitama prefecture which is going to have an event center, a mall, a hotel, and a museum, all themed around Japanese pop culture and anime. You know, maybe I should have booked my ticket there instead instead of down south. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I've always I've always wanted to um, I've always wanted to see what sort of crazy I can get myself into in uh, in Akihabara or Rapongi. Although, let, although let's be honest, I'd probably be spending way too much goddamn time in, in um in arcade in arcades and um, po and possibly seeing if I can get a steakhouse jacket. <laughs> oh, dude, Ribera's Steakhouse, I, I'd be down for that. 
especially since Slick Rick has been tormenting me for the last month on Facebook with these di- with these different food challenge places in parts in um parts of Tokyo with some with I, some think we ought, I think we got I think we got a Dave Slick Rick for that. I would, but I kind of opened myself up to that given my reputation at Continental Breakfasts, which Shades can attest to. With the fact that I um I became the two plate guy. Oh God! <laughs> and the thing I will always find funny is the first time, the first time around, he had, when he saw me get a second plate, he he was like, "You're not you're you're not gonna have any room for, you're not gonna have any room for lunch at that rate." And I'm like, "Nope, I will I will have plenty of room." Because. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be running all I'm gonna be running around all over the place. That's gonna that's gonna build a workout. And plus, the 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 next time I was there, I was the I was the dumbass who decided to come to Florida in a three piece suit. So, not the smartest thing I ever did, but it was still worth it. But let's let me see let's see what the. But they've got some. They've got some. Uh, de- they've got some decent, a- decent anime in the in the thing, and they've they have a map listing out each of each of the manhole covers, which um, you know, in a weird way, it reminds me. It reminds me of that um, scavenger hunt when there are all those Snoopy covers, not Snoopy covers, but Snoopy statues all over Minnesota. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you heard about that little story, but that was a that was a thing in the um, late '90s, early 2000s, where they, there was a bit of a scavenger hunt of all these di- of all these different varieties of Snoopy statues, um, all all over the Twin Cities area. Makes for a nice little scavenger hunt. So. Now next, um, are you from Maddie? Are you familiar with the YouTuber group Bat in the Sun? As a Power Ranger fan, I am very familiar with them, and their unfortunate love of Jason David Frank. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. They're, they're working on a Batman short film called. Dying is easy, and and they re- they released a fo- a photo of their of of Kevin Porter in their bat suit, and um. Okay, it's can it's hard to see the details because of the shadowing, but um. That looks like it came straight out of that looks like a more modern take of the um of the old eighties one of the old eighties one, just without the oh, yeah, yellow yeah. background. But it does actually, and the side by side of Porter dressed as Bruce Wayne and then under the cowl. Um, that's good. <laughs> yeah. No, n- I, I, okay, I got, I got nothing on that one. They, they, they got it. Yep, they got it. Um, then we also have Aaron Sh- Aaron Schronke, who was pre- who I'd previously seen in the web series Ninjak vs. the Valiant Universe, which is actually pretty good. And yeah, JDF was in it, but the other person who was in it that redeems it, Jomo. Mm. Who I'm s- I'm sorry to say, but John John Morrison should John Morrison needs to be needs to play more comic book heroes or. If we ever get another live action Ninja Turtles, let hi- let him oh, play Casey Jones. Please. You know what? I'm willing to bet John Morrison is regretting that dump truck of, uh, of full of money that WWE gave him to come back. Oh, what seem what have they done? The think the last thing I heard from the last thing that I heard that he was doing was essentially reviving the dirt sheet um which did which um felt hollow to me because both because both John because jo- both John Morrison and the Miz have have um have made such have made such strides on their own that bringing back that bringing back that old team up um 
doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It feels like a regression. Why do you think I'm saying he regrets it? Like, I I'm miss going to Johnny that. Mundo. I'm going to that he actually does. I miss Johnny Mundo and the Worldwide Underground because that was gr that was great heel work. Dude, I miss Lucha Underground in general. I um. Well, fortunately, the whole sh the whole series is on um, is on Tubi for free. And oh yeah. Um, and if I'm ever so inclined, I may make that the subject of a watch party. Do it. Espe especially since it was there there were two luchadores who who um instantly wormed their wormed their way in, into my cold little heart through th through that show. One of them you're get one of them you're get you're already see you're already seeing as par as part of the best three man team in AEW right now. Oh yeah. Cuz my whole I know I know some people really really liked um really really liked Phoenix because of the stuff that he can do. But to be honest, mm -hmm. Pentagon is much more of a total package. Sorry, yeah, Lex. Luke Sorry. Underground made Pentagon Jr. Mm -hmm. and he put him over in that series. Yeah. Um, I think the majority of his mainstream um, of his mainstream presence right now is due to Lucha Underground. Yeah. That show made him a, a, a mainstream star. The other the other one that um that I that I really that I really enjoyed and un unfortunately I think he's still I think he's still just the AAA guy where he's not, where um he's not going to be able to he's not going to be able to really go far in that in that company because it's AAA. Hey, it's, Mil Muertes. Um, no, not Mil Muertes. Mil, Mil Muertes is, has already made his money. That what he was um well in TNA he was Ju he was Judas Macias, remember? Oh yeah 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 yeah. But no, Drago. Ah, uh, yeah. Like, cool gimmick. Bad, bad. I think he just wanted to stay in Mexico. Which, hey, to be fair, in the state of of the of the uh, scene at the time, as soon as uh, that uh, particular uh, Lucha Underground one Lucha Underground hit, bit the dust. I mean, his decision at the time wasn't exactly a wrong one, but in hindsight, it's one of those maybe he should have stuck it out. Who knows? Like. The times that I have watched AAA, I only see him in atomic. I only see him in atomical matches, which are fun, but that feels like a waste. I mean, let's be honest. This is AAA. They're not exactly known for. Uh... Well, they're not. They're, outside of being AAA, AAA, ah, I don't. I don't think they're very much known for uh, much else, really. Um, I think the. They sort they, um, honestly, the big the big problem with both AAA and CMLL is the politics. Like we talk we talk about backstage politics up in uh, nor in northern in um in the in the U.S. and can in the U.S. and Canada when it comes to wrestling. Um, Mexico is worse. Espe especially yeah. the Luch especially the luchadores. Need we bring need we bring back the whole. The funny thing is, I liked Sexy Star during her during her run in um in Lucha Underground, but then Triple Mania happened, and that incident that instantly got her blackballed from every indie oh, promotion yeah, ever. Star. Yeah, like the minute you go into business for yourself, is the minute you blackball yourself out of most wrestling things nowadays. Yep. I, she, I, admittedly, she's she she's been wanting to branch out in boxing and MMA, and for all intents and purposes, good luck to that. But you know, if she had just kept to herself and not fuck everything, try to fuck everything up, she'd pre probably be in AEW or uh, one of the Joshi uh, promotions in Japan. She would make a killing. She mm -hmm. she is literally no pun intended. She is a star. Yeah. Until she fucked it up, of course. Yeah. Now, getting back to the matter at hand, um, I gotta say I do like Aaron Schroke's depiction here of the Joker. Um, it feels very '80s Joker to me. 
Like this is it. Like this is this is the kind of this is the kind of Joker I'd I'd see in the um in the eighties in the um eighties comic books, i.e. Bronze Age Joker, more than it does say, um Mark more than say Mark Hamill or or any or even um Jack Nicholson Joker. Um. But apparently they want to do a almost horror film feel with this particular short film. And they they are currently trying to get funding on Indiegogo. It's worked out pretty it's worked out pretty well for them. Um and I think they were able to get a bunch of people work working on the thing because hell, LA's closed because LA's closed because of the whole COVID thing, so they got nothing else to do. <laughs> pretty much. Although be, just make sure that the mayor doesn't cut off your power because you decide because you decided to actually do things. Yeah, that happened. But then we have the. F so, just as a, just as a bu just as a bunch of voice actors were having really bad hot takes about Kiss Anime sh um, getting shut down. Then anime log happens. This is why you don't tempt the gods of irony. And we anime log is going to be a is going to be a YouTube channel that will be streaming various anime titles free of charge and they have the backing of 30 animation studios. Yep, this distribute series officially licensed from over thirty companies. It is, it is. So the studios, the studios involved include Kodansha, Shogakukan Shueisha Productions, and Toei. And they and they intend to not censor. Any of any of the stuff that they're going to be uploading, they hope they hope to have three thousand separate titles by twenty twenty two. Now it's currently region restricted and only available to Japanese viewers, but they did announce that they have plans to include English and Chinese language subtitled content in the future. Um, That's good. This could. Now, depend now. Um, depending, this could create this could create a very interesting conundrum. Give, given given the fact that if this if this gets if this um if this gets enough traction, I think certain parties at uh, I think certain um licensing companies might ha might have to approach things with a little more trepidation because if this gets big enough, a um. The companies like Kodansha or Toei could say, "Why should we license it out to du to dub to you when we can just cut out the middleman?" I'm not saying that's going to uh, that's going to happen, but it's definitely but it's definitely a nuclear option that that um that it is a possibility, and I think any, anything and everything is on the table at mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. Now. I get the feeling it's. I get the feeling their focus. Their focus is going to be more on classics right now, but if they're planning on having three thousand titles in two years, I put the emphasis on the right now part of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm per if this means that certain that certain anime that aren't available on streaming services and are expensive as hell to get end up getting a chance on this. I'm perfectly fine with that. And like I said to a certain voice actor who had a really dumb take of, about the piracy question, I had basically said, when I can get when I can recommend people to watch Roni the Roni Kenshin OVAs, specifically the prequel OVAs, because it is really, really, really good, without breaking the fucking bank, then you'll have an argument. Yeah. Especially with this whole because one of the arguments that I've heard is you're on, why you're on, you're only playing why are you why are you whining about affordability? You're only paying ten bucks. 
Yeah, if it's on there. And we and last month we talked about a bunch of stuff that got taken off of Crunchyroll. Like I've I've said I've stated that piracy is an overrated boogeyman. When people when people are lamb when people are um, talking up a storm about the evil piracies, first off, people who pirate are still are always going to be in the minority. Second off, piracy is a symptom. Yeah. And third, when it comes when it comes to fan subbers, they end up being the. Ca- I have to I have to ask consider consider this. Would Toku Shoutsu happen if it weren't for the prominent fan subbing communities around various Tokusatsu works, especially through through uh, groups like TV Nihon? In in what in a word, no. In two words, hell no. In an alternate version of two words, fuck no. Yeah. the The point is anybody who's anybody who's see. I will make. I will maintain that anybody who is seeing the piracy thing as, the, as this boogeyman or as a black and white form is a fucking idiot. You know, at the, at the very least, when the bootleg question was brought up to, um, to the, to the front man for dream theater, he, he outright, his version of fixing that whole issue is to, is to release official bootlegs because he would bootleg. He would. He would have a collection. He had a collection of bootleg cons, of concerts growing up, so it would be hypocritical of him to lamb to lambast people doing bootlegs of his own concerts. So it's like if, if people are going to do that, I may I may as well make it easy. So next, I want to talk about Ghost of Tsushima a bit because this game is really fucking good. Yeah, it's not it's not as original or as innovative as some people would want it to be, but the way I the way I see it, Ghost of Tsushima is like is like winning is like um somebody winning the lottery. You know, there are two there are two types of people who win the lottery, and I will admit I'm ripping off Blob with this, but he but this was one of those rare moments where he made a good point. Some people when they win the lottery they move into a way bigger house than they than they normally had because they think they're supposed to, and that and the problem is they don't spend enough time maintaining that house. The smart people stay in the same house that they're at, but use the extra money to to do a bunch of spruce ups to make the house that they're in better. Tsushima is playing with familiar tools. But is playing with them extremely comfortable. There is that it is not interested in doing any sort of wasted movement or wasted energy. Tr- everything in there is purposeful. And now, and no, nobody actually asked for this, but they are doing a co-op multiplayer mode later this year. That will be available as a free update. In it, we have, we have instead of following Jin, we have four ki- we have four characters that have been built up as legends: the hunter, the samurai, the ronin, and the assassin. You play in groups of two to four and are dealing with a series of co-op story missions, that are, or as a four-player squad, a wave-based survival setup. They've also teased a four-player raid mode, which would be interesting. And incidentally, I got the uh, July NPD numbers earlier this week. Ghost of Tsushima was the top sell was the top selling console game. Nice. So I can I can throw that and I can throw that into the ardent defenders of The Last of Us Part Two that got so butthurt about this game, e- even going with the whole mud, mud imperialism, despite the fact that this takes place before imperialist Japan was even a thing. Unfortunately, as far as the details of this multiplayer mode, we don't have a whole lot, but I get the feeling we'll be getting some in about a month. Now next, um, 
I wanted to highlight how John Favreau has a, it seems to be take seems to be do, trying to do some course correction in how Lucasfilm creatives deal with Star Wars fans. And I get the oh. feeling that he that um I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years Favreau ends up being the one who's in full who's in full control of Lucasfilm instead of instead of Nero. I.e. Kathleen I, Kennedy. I would not be surprised. But he had spoke to the Hollywood reporters and regarding fan feedback, saying, you put something out in the world and then it echoes back at you. You have to listen. It's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. You have to feel the energy of the audience. But when you come from comedy, and when I was doing improv back in Chicago, that's it. You have to read the room, you have to feel the room. You have to be in community with the audience. You have to be part of it. The fact of the matter is, as much as we love working on Star Wars, we love even more making Star Wars for other people. And then when other people are excited by it, dig what we're doing and are appreciative, that's as good as it gets for us. We, And he had stated that his goal from the get-go with The Mandalorian was to tell simple stories, saying, We really wanted to wind it back to the things that inspired the original Star Wars and really get it small in scale and tell simple stories. Because part of what you inherit when you're going to see Star Wars now is this whole history, because the stories have been told for decades, and it was nice with the new medium, to be able to start with a new set of characters to introduce to a new audience. You mean a set of actual characters instead of caricatures, right? <laughs> <laughs> he said, But we always knew, and this is something I learned from over at Marvel and working with Kevin Feige, is that you always want to keep the core fans in mind, because, because they have been the ones that have been keeping the torch lit for many, many years. But these are also stories for young people and for new audiences. These are myths, and so and so you always want to have an outstretched hand to people who not who might not have that background, and so you're really telling two stories at once. You're telling the story for people who are fresh eyes, and you're telling the story for the people who have been here with the property and with the characters, and these and the stories for so many years. A bit of a Freudian slip there, and make sure you're honoring them as well. To to have to. To have a way to create a freshness while still being respectful of what came before, I think is one of the challenges of storytellers in this moment, because we're inundated with so much content. Now everything's at the touch of a finger, so everybody has a tremendous cultural context. You know, everybody's checking your work. Which is that's that's quite a that's quite a radical shift from Roundhead calling pe calling his critics man babies. So, say what you say what you will about Favreau and how and how and what and what good or bad has come out of the Mandalorian, but Favreau gets it, and I th I think have I think having an improv background helped helped him in this regard because when you're it when you're in that you can't just well you're doing improv you're not going to be sticking too much in the way of a script you've got to read the damn room and. I certainly am appreciative of that as as somebody who's watched and go and um absorbed a whole lot of stand up. Plus being on stage, you gotta read the room. And hey, if if he took over and he and he got the chance to do a re to do a redone ep episodes episodes seven through nine, I don't think anybody would have a problem. Well, let me rephrase that. Anybody with culture would have a problem. The usual suspects would have a problem, but they weren't going to buy tickets anyways. So, fuck them. <laughs> In incidentally, because of my height, a, f a buddy of mine has has been com has been comparing me a little bit unfairly to bad luck Fale, especially with my propensity to say fuck them. <laughs> I think Folly's bigger. I think Folly is a lot, to a bit taller than me, but I'll, and he's definitely bigger than me, but I'll take it. Yeah. So next, I like Devolver Digital, and I like when a company is willing to admit they fucked up, and this was a case where they fucked up because. 
So Fall Guys has come out. I've played it a couple times. Um, do you remember... Mandy, do you remember Takashi's Challenge? Takashi's Challenge, a.k.a. Most Extreme Elimination Challenge? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, yeah. I am very familiar. Yeah, Fallen Guys is kind of like that, ex except it's what would happen if some people left Fortnite and, des and designed their own version of Takashi's Challenge <laughs> with, mo with more people. And... Um, the game, the game is fun, but it is also pain, and it managed to break Yong Ye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, I've been watching. Uh, I one of the things I've been doing, uh, you know, while working at work uh, during some downtime is in the background. I would have uh, Twitch streams. One of them is happens to be Grand Pooh Bear, who has become a huge fan of that game. Actually, so you've you probably seen him. You've probably seen him screaming about screaming whenever he gets knocked down or so. Or oh, oh yeah, happen. but he's he's one of quite a few games actually, which is definitely saying some because I can't I can barely get I can barely get through one round, but it's one of those things where after you get your ass kicked, you want to try you want to try again. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm not sure what that says about us that maybe we're a lot more masochistic than we care to admit. I will see this: the soundtrack and the design is a beat. Mm -hmm. That is for sure. Um, I did have I did have to I I did have to lambast Mark Kern when he when um somebody had pointed out that our, that Rule Thirty Four has already has already inflicted the Fall Guys, and he asked, "Can I have the link for Science?" And then five minutes later, he says, "I'm sorry, I asked for the link," and I had to reply to him, "How many times have I told you not to tempt the gods of irony? Apparently not nah. enough." <laughs> but what ended up happening is there was a there was apparently a um there was apparently a scam apparently a scam going on where the where um the price in Argentina was listed too low by mistake and uh, they ended up and Devolver Digital ended up canceling a bunch of keys because because they because they were trying to combat scammers but they accidentally got a few legit purchasers in the crossfire now, fortunately, they they had they um they had they they had caught they had caught their mistake, apologized, and had basically said, "Hey, if you if you had your key if you had your key revoked and you purchased and you purchased legit, um, give give us a give us a con give us an email, um, send send some of the send send the send the receipts if you got them, and we'll work something out." Basically, give us a call. We'll fix it for you. Mm -hmm. And considering how successful the game is, I'm pretty sure like this is probably affecting what tops five uh, five hundred to maybe five thousand. Worst comes to worst, they they give up. They have to give up. A, they have to give up some free keys out of the deal. I don't think they're. I think that they're doing this. So, like, you want you want to play? Go ahead, play. We'll give you the free key. Mm -hmm. On the house, have fun. But next, so one of my favorite GameCube games, especially to play in groups, Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. As it turns out, it's getting a whole lot of extra content for this remastered edition. Thirteen post-game dungeons, as well as some additional costume and weapon DLC. Now, the costume and weapon DLC, I don't care about that. But the fact that they're going to have 13 post-game dungeons is interesting. Because the, the original game already had 14 dungeons. And since Ooh. these are post-game dungeons, I'm probably going to get my ass kicked. A lot. Because I know how Square... I know how companies like Square and Tri-Ace do their post-game dungeon stuff. Um... Or the, or their extra bosses like the hell that is playing any playing against any sort of weapon, or playing against Gabriel Celeste in um in a Tri Ace game. There's a reason Tri Ace bo Tri Ace boss syndrome became a pejorative for me. They'll fuck you up. Hmm.
but I do I do like Crystal I do Crystal Chronicles. I've seen some people dismiss it because of the fact that it was a multiplayer focused um, RPG, but it actually handles the multiplayer thing pretty well, and I'd be inter I'll be interested to see how it's going to handle it here. And at the very least, since it's going since it's going to be on PC as well, I won't have to deal with shitty ass netcode. Looking at you, Switch. <laughs> I like I like my Switch, but the facts are the facts. Yeah, they have good games. They have shit internet service. Shit, they have shit internet. Mm -hmm. So next, you knew this was coming, and um, this was my mark out moment. <laughs> because <laughs> now, yes, I did see season one of the of the remade um, Orphan. It's really good, and I'm very happy to, to note that David Mach that David Matranga got the got the role that he had been begging for. Because he, because when I met when I met him at MetroCon, he made very clear he that um that when he was catching wind that they were going to be doing something for the anniversary of the original series, he wanted to come back because that was his first role. And we are get and we are getting a second season that's going to be airing next January. Hey. Now, the main reason that this is even happening is to celebrate this 25th anniversary of, of the uh, light novel series. But I'm I'm looking f I'm looking forward to de to delving to delving into this and s and um and seeing how and seeing I'm seeing what's going to be similar, what's going to be different. Although I should note this re this remake is um a lot more in line with the with the manga than the original anime was the original anime made a made a significant amount of changes compared to the compared to the original work um which I'm, I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing i'm not i'm not a purist or, or anything like that but it is something to make note of Next, this would have been in Asshats of Activision um, on principle, but the worst kept secret is out. The next Black yeah. Ops is going to focus on the Cold War. And, you know, here's the thing I find really, really, really funny. Yeah. So... You know how the usual suspects have tried have been trying to push this whole all media is political kind of thing. They got real salty when the announcement trailer for for Black Ops Cold War featured footage from Yuri Bezmenov, a KGB informant who defected in 1970. And and what and um had a lot to say about the dangers of communism. And in a lot of those cases, he was right. But they got so base. It was basically a case of all games. It was basically a case of we want politics in our video games, but not those politics. <laughs> Hey, you want you want like, I think I think, we, I think it got old a decade ago. The whole damn franchise. Let's be honest. I uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be jumping at this um because this do, this does feel this does feel like the same kind of nostalgia bait that I saw with Call of Duty World War II, with, where yeah. they thought, hey, we'll go hey we'll go back to World War II. That'll redeem ourselves. Um, sure. Uh, Sure. Here's here's the problem though. This is inevitably going to get compared to Black Ops, which is part, which is part which is part of, is part of what could be considered the holy trinity of the good Call of Duty games. Um those those being those being Modern Warfare, World at War, and Black Ops. Those those are cons 
that's what's considered the holy trinity of 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 the good call of duties for a lot of people um although black ops 2 is no slouch either but it loses points because of its zomb is of its zombies mode not being as good black ops the original black ops and world at war are two of are two of my favorites um even even if the japanese campaign is a little bit short but this one is being is being done by Treyarch and Raven, um, but ultimately the the problem that the problem that I'm, that it's going to have is I feel bad if they if they do if they do some sort of AMA and most of the questions are what are the what do the numbers mean and if if you want if you want more detail about why about why um. I like the original Blackout so much. Just go watch Ackman's video on it. He's going to cover it in a lot more detail than I am. But the fact that they, um, the fact that the story is going to revolve around Perseus, which is supposedly the uh, code name of a Soviet spy that had gained access to the Manhattan Project, allegedly. I mean, maybe they're trying. I'm a little I'm really hesitant to say that they are especially since they're especially since Activision's probably going to want to shoehorn Warzone in this thing. Mm. But mm, I'm going to wait. I think that's the best option. Wait and wait and see how th how things turn out. So next, um, a little something that I've been keeping an eye on. Sense, a cyberpunk ghost story, is going to be launching in three days. This was a game that tr that the snowflakes tried to cancel, and it back it backfired. They tried to take tried. they and it's um and it's come and it's coming all the way in, and it's going to be on it's going to be on Steam on August 25th and on consoles sometime this fall. Apparently their two their two main inspirations are Clock Tower and Fatal Frame, which interesting combination there. Especially since Clock Tower is is a very is very against a lot of concepts that we see in survival horror. Namely, the fact that you cannot kick the monster's ass. You might be able to slow him down a little bit, but he's still he's still going to keep chasing you, and you never know where he's going to show up. Mm hmm. But let's not talk about Clock Tower Three because Clock Tower Three was fucking weird. Now next, um. Raji, an ancient epic, which is a action adventure that's inspired by Indian myth, as one could probably tell with the name. That is that is coming. That's going to be. That is now on the uh, Switch, and it'll be available um, on PC. It says sometime third quarter twenty twenty. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I don't see it until September. I'd seen some people comp at cl claim that the game is Indian God of War. Um, I don't. S I don't see the God of. I don't see a God of War comparison. But what I do. But what I would say they're probably taking some notes from is Prince of Persia. And. Hey, if it's an opportunity to explore a type of mythology I don't get to explore often, so I'm fine with that. Hey, that'll work. Mm -hmm. So next, Baldur's Gate 3 is going to be entering early access at the end of September. And
it and it looked and the only th the only thing that I the only th now there's a couple things that I'm very cautious about one the footage that I saw for Baldur's Gate three felt a little too close to the Divinity series. Now, don't get me wrong, I like Divinity, but it's one of the it's one of those things where am I looking at Baldur's Gate or am I looking at um Divinity 3 in a different coat of paint? Also I'm cur also um I'm curious about how stringent they're going to be with the D&D 5th edition rules because PC style RPGs thrive on customization, and there's not a whole lot of customization in the fifth edition rule set. Yeah, we'll have to see. Now they said that it's it's they say that it's inspired by fifth edition rules, so I'm hoping that means that they're not taking a one for one. Because if they end up if they end up using spell charges in this thing, I'm out. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing the whole spells per day and then make me rest eight hours before I can cast my before I can throw fireballs again. <laughs> I have never liked that setup. I didn't like it in the I didn't like it in the original Final Fantasy. I didn't like it in Sui Koden. I don't. I never liked it in D and D. I have at best tolerated it. But there's a reason why most people use an MP system instead. Yeah. So next, um, Hades is leaving early access and going into a full 1.0 release. And will be launching fall 2020 for PC and Switch. Now Hades, I have had since it first... That, that, that was the first purchase that I made on the Epic Game Store. And, um... It is really damn addictive. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to the launch trailer, props on them for doing this, for doing this old cutscene thing, showing the cycle of the game of... of Kicking ass, then dying, coming back to Hades, and then doing it again. Because yeah, you are ba you are basically playing as Zagreus trying to get out of trying to get out of Hades. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> Although you know it's it's got to get it's got to get really confusing to to for your father to be named Hades while you're trying to escape from Hades. But and of course unsurprisingly um this is from Supergiant. They don't do bad games. The so next um fault a little game called Fallen Knight was announced by uh, P-Cube. Which has you being a robot descendant of Lancelot with robotic knights. With, the, with combat focusing on disarming your enemies instead of outright killing them. Although I look I look at the gameplay and I have to wonder was somebody playing a little bit too much Mega Man 0? <laughs> no god. No. Oh. Maybe. Hey, not that not that I'm complaining. Especially since it 
The thing that the, the thing that I always that I always want in my platformers is a sense of pace. You know, speed, mobility, all that all that fun stuff. It looks like we're getting that even though I'm waiting I'm waiting for cringe because I know somebody's going to compare the look of this to Mighty Number no. 9 even though I don't think that's fair because this doesn't look like shit. But next, we we did finally get some gameplay look for Necromunda, so we'll get to see we'll get to see how closely it's going to resemble the board game. Although the fact that it's being published by Focus leaves a bit of a bit of a um, sour taste in my mouth. <laughs> but I do I do enjoy I do enjoy the look of this. I mean, it's Necromunda is a hive city, and the best way to describe a hive city is imagine Mega City One on steroids, and a worse place to live. And you've seen the Judge Dredd movie, so you know how bad Mega City One is already. Okay, so we've we've got a fair amount of gang building. That's that came that came with the territory. Um But so far what I'm so far what I'm seeing out of this is it's go it's going it's going standard turn based. Um the thing that I'm curious about is what what they sh this is done by the same team that did Mordheim. And what I want to figure out is what's diff what's different mechanically in this case. Aside from the fact that you have future weapons instead of fantasy weapons, which means you're probably going to have more guns. And given the setup that we have to do, it probably means that we'll also have to deal with um, the XCOM problem. 99% chance to hit. Still miss. <laughs> Sounds like John Tavares during the playoffs. <laughs> that damn goalpost, man. <laughs> Get it. That's one of those plays that you're not going to live down. No. Especially since... How... Didn't they extremely front load his contract? Or put or put him at or put him at way too much money with a no movement clause. But now next, um, one game that I've I had heard about back in January called A Long Way Down is going to be heading into early access later this month. In which, in which you're you're dealing with basically a deck-based RPG. In fact, it describes itself as a mashup between an RPG and a deck-building game, where you're trying to escape a maze. So, I guess I could say it's got some. I guess I could say it's it's like Kingdom Hearts: Chain of Memories, except it makes sense. Unfortunately, I fear that people are going to make some unfair comparisons between this and Slay the Spire. But at the very at the very least, I'd be willing to give it a try, especially since I've always been a sucker for card-based mechanics in games. Um, next, oh, Crisis finally finally has a launch day, September eighteenth. Yay! I guess this is Crytek trying to redeem themselves after the shitstorm that was that that was their um, little lawsuit with Star Citizen, where they where they ended up acting as the jilted ex-girlfriend. 
Now this this is mainly a tech trailer to um sh to show the difference between um the upgrades from their old technology from back in 2007 which still holds up pretty well. Then again, Crisis back in 2007 was known for completely melting graphics cards. But yeah, they've updated lighting and assets. It looked pretty it looked pretty good back then, but it looks really good now. So far, so good, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they do the same with Warzone so we could get a re so we could get a revival of Living Legends. Probably not, but I can dream. We're probably gonna see some proper gameplay footage in about a month. And I know some people will lament that it's that its PC version is gonna be on the Epic Game Store instead of um instead of on instead of on Steam, but It'll be it'll be on Steam in due time. Just patience. Let's see, and I, I already talked about Fallen Night, and then there was this one that completely blew that completely blew everybody away. So we've talked shit about the about the um about the gaming scene in China, but in actuality, the the um. The independent gaming scene in China has been gradually gaining some momentum over the last few years. And the most recent example of this is a, is a game being made by a bunch of um, ex-Tencent people called Black Myth Wukong. And, and, and I'll give you one guess who you're playing as. John Cena? I ought to Dave you. Okay, that was a bad joke. That was a bad joke. You could Dave me for that. Dave! <laughs> ah. Yeah, you deserved that one. No, oh, Sun Wukong. I did. Yeah. Would it help if I went by his Japanese name? Son Goku. Maybe. Oh. Now, as far as now, they're using Unreal Engine Four and really putting it through its paces. They're planning to release for PC for console, but they do not have a release date. They've stated it will release when it's ready as a paid game, which means they probably have no intention on doing early access. It will mm. focus on the Monkey King, and it's there's the possibility that this is taking place after the story of Journey to the West when he became known as the Victorious Fighting Buddha. Um, the studio has mostly worked on mobile slash PC games, with Art of War Red Tides being their most well known, but this is going to be a whole new challenge for them. They do have a website up, but it's in Chi it's in Chinese. The stud they and this is being done on a, on a staff of forty people. Which is imp which is impre which is impressive. Um, I know some people are going to be like, where's the scam? I'm, I'm not entirely sure there is a scam here because these guys are independent. It's not like they're not working yeah. for Tencent. Or in, if they're working for Tencent, I'd expect bullshit, but they're not. In fact, you've got a bunch I of... Feel, got I, I doesn't feel like there's, bu there, there's bullshit anyway. Mm -hmm. um, he then followed up and said, So prior to the studio founding, some of them worked on the Quantum Studio on a game called Asura. It was basically a Journey to the West MMO for PC that ended up on, that was aimed to be a hit but didn't um, perform up to snuff. Some of the devs that worked on Asura left Tencent to form Game Science Studio in June 2014, which has locations in Shenzhen and Hangzhou. 
They had first worked on a mobile RPG slash card game called 100 Heroes that was published by NetEase. Then they published Art of War Red Tides, which was a multiplayer strategy game. Um, they, and they're apparently working on a successor for that, but that's under wraps right now. At the end of 2017, they said that conditions were right for Chinese de developers to enter the premium games market as platforms like Steam had become more popular. They apparently want to create a full-on AAA premium-style game that could usher in a new era for premium Chinese games. If that's the case, maybe that'd help um, raise some raise some of the reputation because there are within within the independent end of things, there are some talented games coming out of China. Project Fist and on and on all mutation and being two among them. That and those aren't being. Some of them, as well as a, a certain project that was that was mostly developed by one guy. And apparently, the games that they had that the, that they had treated as learning experiences were God of War, Monster Hunter World, and Sekiro. The gameplay demo that they recently showcased was the result of two plus years of development learning Unreal Engine 4 and implementing new processes. It is far from completion, and they want to, per they want to perfect what they showcase into a full-length game that is worth an asking price. They are currently hiring 19 new devs and will probably hire more. And, um... Of course, the first comment I see in that on this is from Deathblade. Of course, he'd be on this, but they put out a 13-minute demo, which I feel I feel I feel is apt to take a look at. Let me adjust, let me adjust the volume on this a bit so we can take a look at that for a bit. So the company is from is called Game Science. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I forgot about Bloody Spell, which is janky, but I still I still like it for be for being a faster souls like. Yeah, whatever works, right? Mm -hmm. I might record some video of me of me playing Bloody Spell when I get the chance. I just can't record any PS4 footage until, uh, until I can figure out how to fix my uh, capture card. Yeah. Either that, or I'd have to get, or I'd have to get my motherboard replaced and puts and put one that has better USB um, ports. But. I can certainly say I enjoy I enjoy the um, art direction that they're going with this. And of course, this is of course this is a pre-alpha game build, and give I can understand people's trepidation with it just being a with it just being a pre-alpha, but. For a presentation using Unreal Engine 4, I'd say this looks pretty good. Even though it's even though it's going to be weird of of when it comes to playing as a cicada for bits of it, because. Well, Sun Wukong is a trickster, so that involves so that includes transformations. And I can definitely see the souls like comparisons and the and the and the whole thing with uh, Sekiro. Although I'd say I'd say this is significantly faster 
than than a Souls like. And Sekiro had a bit of a rhythm game kind of kind of feel to its combat, where it was more about breaking posture. So I think I, and they're really putting Unreal Four through its paces with those particle effects. Let me, let me see if I can skip ahead a bit. Okay, so... Well, one, one fear is averted. It looks like we may be getting other weapons aside from just the Neoe bow. And... And that is a giant head. That, that that is a that is a big head, yeah. You know, I make a big a big head joke, but I don't know anyone with big heads. Big egos, maybe, but not big heads. Um. I was going to I was going to bring up Luke Gallows but he'd probably get mad at me because of how often he hits his head on things. <laughs> oh, you, you don't believe me. I don't think we want Sex Ferguson on this show. <laughs> First thing we do, ladies and gentlemen, Sex Ferguson. Fuck you, buddy. And he's already got like five like five cases of beer deep. Oh, like we're one to talk. Like I said, five cases. I mean, <laughs> we're not ones to talk, but we're, we have sensibilities here. We have limits, mostly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have we have lim we have limits, and then there and then there's the times that we end up playing something like the Stephen King drinking game. Oh God. <laughs> But obviously, using a using a staff that's gonna you're there's probably a bunch of monk jokes that you that you're already thinking of. <laughs> and you wouldn't be completely off base with them. Although um, the Neoi in in an action game like this, something like the Neoi bow, or if you're a little less in or if you're a little more weebish, the power pull from the original Dragon Ball. Yeah, keep in mind Dragon Ball was originally going to be a modern take on Journey to the West, but Toriyama forgot. <laughs> but you you already have a few allusions to Journey to the West in, in several of the characters, Goku being the obvious one. Even though he, even though he doesn't, he can't transform the same way Sun Wukong can. Um, Bulma effectively being Sanzo, the Eternal Dragon being Sanzo's horse, and Oolong being well, a pig. There was also that Sayuki anime in the early two thousands, which was pretty good. <laughs> And um, that's a lot of floof on that on this on that guy. <laughs> yeah. He's people people called people called me a wolf man when I grew my beard out. But those little details are something that I'm really interested in seeing how they're going to develop that and how they're going to put that into a full game, without having to compromise too much. They'll probably be if if they take their time, they'll probably be able to do it. Especially since the vibe that I'm getting is that we won't see a full release of this game for two years. 
But if there's one little nitpick that I have with them... Up the up the HUD size, please, because those the uh, health, what I'm assuming are health, um, p magic power, and um, energy, those bars are way too small. Ooh, yeah, that jeez, uh, that that's gonna fuck up your eyes if you're not careful. Especially considering how much dodging and weaving you're gonna be doing, you're you're not gonna be keeping a close eye on something that far off. In fact, this is. This is precisely why a lot of games um, put help, put the health bar at the top of the of the screen instead of at the bottom, because that's going to be closer to where your eyes are going to be focusing on. I do like that they're making good use of of Wu Kong's ability to transform. Then we kicked a certain boss's ass, and now we get to now we get to look like him for a few seconds. Hey, why not, right? Mm -hmm. But they sorry, carbonation. They talk about. Um... In this game, they t they talk about ha about having seventy two different abilities because Sun Wukong had that many. Okay, two two Wukongs. That's interesting. The vibe that I'm getting is that this is ba this is um, based on Journey to the West, but it's not telling the exact same story. That's one ugly ass bug. And that's an even uglier bug. Ooh. Oh yeah, I guess we will be riding on the Nimbus in this thing. Cool. And apparently fighting in heaven. Now, in addition to that, we also got to look at some some uh, promotional screenshots and artwork. And yeah, it looks like you'll looks like you'll have two forms of this. One, I'd say, one of them is going to be Sun Wukong, and then the other is. Um, the victorious fighting Buddha. But I get the feeling this is not something to be sleeping on. Apparently, the de and apparently the developers are not fully satisfied with the quality of the experience for right now, and they're. It says that they're concerned about pr content production efficiency. Which is why they want to hire some more people. I think it's to I think it's to put more hands on deck. Um, just one request, game science: don't put your devs through crunch. And since you're doing this independent, you you um you shouldn't ha you shouldn't have to. But uh, I do I do appreciate the fact that they state that they want to be satisfied as gamers before they commit to a date. Although they had to be a bit cute about it by saying that it shouldn't take 500 years. So, I can see I can see why this made waves. I know Aaron would I know Aaron would say what's the catch because it's from China, but um fuck him. <laughs> now, now, for the last bit, I had to call a bit of an audible. 
Oh. Because this because I ended up getting this dropped on me as I was prepping today. So looks looks like Rocksteady looks like Rocksteady's back on back on the Batman train. As as it was recently announced at DC Fandom. And are you looking at the Gotham Knights trailer actually? Yeah. I we just that literally just dropped on my recommended thing. I'm actually on the video right now, as a matter of fact. Oh, they ha we have the world premiere trailer and the gameplay trailer, and this is a sequel to Ark to um Arkham Knight. Somewhere north of the city. <coughs> you get to play as Robin, Nightwing, Red Hood, and Batgirl. That's mm -hmm. that's cool. Which, to be honest, this is kind of what I wanted from an if the if another Arkham game was get, was going to be done, to have it fo to have it focus on the ba on controlling the Bat family instead of just Batman. My only concern is, um, don't make this a multiplayer focused experience. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good call. Good call. If you're watching this, I'm dead. This is a cold black. This message was automatically triggered when I destroyed the cave and everything it contained. We both know it won't take long for Gotham's criminals to realize the Batman is gone. Although, and you can't that, the does, that doesn't sound like Conroy, and that's weirding me out. Jim died. Is off. It does sound off. I'm leaving you the belt. I mean, it sounds like Batman, but Kevin Conroy's Batman. That that that's strange. That it's not Kevin Conroy under that under the as the voice of the guy under the cowl. I know you'll keep Gotham safe. Good luck and goodbye. The gang's all here. And apparently the police don't trust the Bat family after Gordon died. Ooh. That's not good. The other thing that I hope that I hope we have with this is that each member of the family has a different play style. Obviously, if, they, if we have all four of them playing the same, then having four characters is going to be pointless. Also known as yeah, the Budokai one, 3 one problem. Might, one, needs, one that needs to have a strength advantage, for example. One needs to be agile, an agility booster, that kind of stuff. At the, ver at the very least, this is prob probably going to end up fixing... One of the main problems that I ha that I had with the uh, with the uh, with Ark of Night, namely giving way too much attention to the vehicle. So those are some sweet ass rides. And hello, Victor. I see that room that rumor ended Not up being true. Alright. So coming to switch one. For if you try yeah. to them, we have no we have no idea. It just says launches twenty twenty one. 
There was a there was a rumor a few months back that Rocksteady was go that Rocksteady was working on was working on a project and one of the main arcs that they were going to go with was the Court of Owls, which was a storyline in the comics um, a few years ago. And it looks like that's what they're going with as the as the main villain for this, which I'm perfectly fine with because one, it's not an, it's not an obvious it's not an obvious pick. It's the same reason I liked having Hugo Strange in Arkham City as the, <laughs> as the prime as one of the primary villains and two it's not the Joker again. And I know some people will bring up the whole thing with the Arkham Knight in well Arkham Knight but that was just that was just a um pointless tease cuz as soon as people found out that it, that it's this new character who has a grudge as a grudge against Batman, every, everybody I knew was like, "It's Jason." <laughs> yeah, even I would be. It's Jason Todd, isn't it? And lo and behold, it was. Yep. So next we have the uh, gameplay demonstration, and this was from a pre-alpha game build. Patrick Redding, creative director on Gotham Knights. On behalf of the whole team at WB Games Montreal, I'm really honored to give you a quick look at our gameplay. That's a um, that's an interesting way to have a chassis for a bike. We're going to look at a short clip from one of Gotham Knights' villain crimes in a pre-alpha build. This mission is halfway through the Mr. Freeze storyline. And we're playing Batgirl. Okay, crisis averted. We won't be. It won't be doing a, a multiplayer focus. Thank God. Normally, normally I would call this horrible weather, but um, given where you and I live, it's just a day that ends in Y. Freeze has recently returned to Gotham with a mysterious agenda that involves manipulating the weather to flash Freeze's city. An important goal for Gotham Knights was that players can play all of the game, either solo or in two-player co-op. Doing drop-in, drop-out co-op, that's gonna that's gonna be tricky. Access the Justice League satellite for short-range teleportation. Yeah. I mean, I mean, kudos if they could pull it off, though. Oh, the. Well, Batgirl has mastered some more familiar techniques. It looks like we still have the, the yeah, same um, free flow combat, and along with a, along with a few familiar twists. We're probably not going to be this good at the start. Montoya here. Heard you down there having some fun. Fun's one word for it. Just a heads up. The chopper's under orders to fire on anything that moves inside. The Gotham City Police. Drop your weapons or we will open fire. We have you partially surrounded. You will not escape. Oh, God, they escaped. Ninja Cloud again. Fuck! The GCPD chopper made that part easy. I mean, the rest of the voice acting is on po on point, but um, I'm guessing Conroy just was just wasn't interested in do in doing a short doing a short doing a short appearance, given that the fo given that Batman is not going to be the focus. Whoa. Oh, hey, look! It's the weather forecast for us in a few months. <laughs> if anyone asks, I meant to do that. Uh, please, I've been enjoying this summer despite the fact that it's 2020. Please don't rub it in. Tours were still going on when Freeze came you know, through. you've seen Game of Thrones. Winter is coming. Uh, I know. Don't remind me. My knees are already feeling it, for God's sakes. I don't want to. I, I, don't, don't remind me. Oh, 
at the, at the very least when at the very least when I head out of my head out of town, town in October it'll be well the, the forecast will probably be in the in the um, 40s which I can handle that oh most of us can handle that mostly to be fair I am looking forward to to, to uh, fall and hoodie we hoodie weather because well oh I do have a couple of hoodies that I like I just like having a jacket. I just like having a jacket. Hmm. To be fair, I did. Yeah, I did buy a pair, a couple of pairs of pants online, and that they got in this week. So I'm already like, you know, subconsciously getting ready for the winter. Um. One thing I, one thing I do have to, I do have to say is, I feel like the, I feel like the music. The music track for the combat is trying a little too hard to be Mick Gordon. Not the safest time to take the elevator. You'd rather take the stairs? <laughs> yeah, take this take the stairs in a skyscraper. Nothing can go wrong from that. No. Come in, come have have a have a couple of drinks, have a few laughs. I definitely enjoy the detail that they ha that they have um, planned, and as it's as it's pointed out, they haven't even announced platforms for this. I mean, will it pr will it probably end up go will it probably end up going on the switch eventually? Oh yeah, it's just a matter of when. Yeah. Let's see. Boss fight? Boss fight. Hang on, let's sing. An open area with a lot of places for cover. Yep. Oh, look, the autosave thing is going on. Yeah, that, that, that. There's your sign. But hey, Mildra. Mm -hmm. Boss fight? Get away from my storm engine. Yep, boss fight. Kitchen? <laughs> you don't want to be on the when this disruptor goes off. Trust me. Irrelevant. I already have what I need. Jesus. Freeze is up. Freeze has upgraded his shit. The storm has risen. Yeah. Nothing can stop it. We'll see about that. You cannot run from me. Also, if you if you see a big glowy thing on the ground, maybe get oh maybe get out of the way before the glowy thing before it becomes a blow uppy thing. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing the whole damage bar, the whole uh, damage numbers thing. That makes me a bit. That makes me a little bit. Um, I'm not hitting the panic button, but I am a, I am a little bit I'm a little bit concerned. It's raising it's it's definitely raising a red flag or two for sure. Yeah, because when I see that kind of thing, I end up thinking that 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 um we're gonna be seeing some form of in some some form of R, of RNG of of RNG shit. Now I hope that doesn't end up happening. But if it but if it do, if it does, we'll know we'll know why. Um, at the very least, this will probably end up turning out better than than the um than that Marvel's Avengers games that en ended up in beta, which I um I see its potential, but I have a lot of problems with it. Now, as far as far as this, as far as Gotham Knights, I like what I'm seeing. It's more a yes. it's more a matter of is it is it is this going to congeal? I do have hope because well, the worst game that the worst game that Rocksteady put out was um 
was Arkham Origins, and that wasn't even all that bad. Hey, you know what? If if that's the worst, I think we're in for a good game. We'll we'll see the we'll see it in twenty twenty one. And we're probably going to get, given given some of the other online or offline conventions that'll ha- that'll happen in a year's time, we're probably going to see some more footage. Um, that'll that'll be detailed. This was more of a proof of concept for a for a for DC fandom. Um, but hey, but hey, it's it's nice to. It seemed like Rocksteady was going was going to be working with something else, but um. I but I well, guess this is a, a something else. It's a hell of a something else. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. And how fi- how fitting is that? How fitting is it that we're going to be going through that when later tonight we're going to be do- we're going to be doing tsunami and dealing with more Batman. Um, you you guys are. I'm probably going to be like in the call watch still watching GDQ. Oh, fair fair enough. But um, that's I'm still be- in the call. I'm still be in the call. Just you know. <laughs> yeah, multitasking. You can walk and chew gum at the same time. Mostly. Um, but that's going to do it for this particular episode of the Mon- of Monastery Gazette. We will see you here next week. Same monk time, same monk channel. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.